I'm here today with Dr. Natalie McDermott, who's a paediatric infections doctor. Um, she's going to watch episode one of the new ITV drama, Breathtaking, to give us her feedback. I'm not going to make it home this weekend, sorry. It's just, it's madness. There's currently no PPE at all. They were overwhelmed. The virus is always going to be ahead. Trust the guidelines. This is insane. Where's the defense? Where's the cash flowing? The public can be assured that we have a clear plan. There's no plan. Members of our team are wearing bin bags and going home wondering if they're going to die in the night. Don't go there. We're already there. You know this thing is spreading. They just keep coming. But no one is giving up. Prepare for the worst. But hope for the best. I think it was very accurate in how it conveys how people felt. Um, how it depicts people not being listened to, people on the front line not being listened to when they were raising concerns. Um, and I think it, you know, gives a good indication of what was happening in A&E departments and intensive care departments before we locked down. And we weren't locking down because of numbers or whatever, but look at our hospitals. People still carry a lot of trauma from that time. And I think that um, everyone was affected by COVID to some degree you know, whether that was directly through losing a loved one, through having it themselves and having long COVID, through people's businesses going under. Um, but I hope that this depicts why, at least at that time, lockdown was essential. I think it will help people to understand better why some of the decisions were made. I think it will help people to understand why we're taking this class action because so many people spoke up and no one was listened to. And, um, you know, people said they had their concerns. People were watching their colleagues die and people still weren't listening about the PPE. And maybe that's because it wasn't available. But, you know, the government can can say that they didn't realise there'd be a worldwide shortage. But that wouldn't be true because when we had an Ebola epidemic in West Africa, there was a worldwide shortage of PPE. That was three countries, not in the entire world, affected. We you can anticipate that there's going to be a worldwide shortage of PPE. I lost colleagues. I wouldn't say that they're people I knew well, uh, but I lost um, a family member who likely had COVID. I uh, know people who've had their lives uh, dramatically affected by COVID um, in terms of long COVID and ongoing health problems as a result. It felt frustrating, but the mm. problem is that at this point in time, I wasn't a consultant yet. I was right. a registrar. Okay. And the NHS is very hierarchical. Yeah. And so you're used to not being listened to. My general paediatric consultants were, because they worked on the ward with me. Um, my infectious disease consultant colleagues weren't. In fact, one of them even shouted me down in an office when I said, but surely we should be taking, even if you don't feel this, the evidence is there scientifically, we should be taking a precautionary approach given this evidence. And he shouted at me and said, that's your opinion. And I was like, no, I feel like it's everyone's opinion. I, I think it will highlight to the public what healthcare workers were dealing with and what level of protection they were being given. Because I think a lot of the public, especially based on the press conferences and stuff, are under the impression that we were all being given good, solid protection. I think when they see, I mean, there were people on the tube wearing better masks than the healthcare workers were wearing in the NHS. Um, when they... Initially, when we went into lockdown, they said the NHS staff didn't have to pay the congestion charge in London. At that point, I was able to drive to work. Um, but in the week before I got COVID again, um, they had, um, even though we were still in lockdown, uh, they uh, decided that we weren't, uh, uh, we were no longer eligible for being exempt of the congestion charge. And so I had to commute to work again. And fortunately, there were literally three people in my carriage on the train uh, including myself we were all more socially distanced than we were in the hospital setting and I had a better grade of mask uh, of my own for that but I wasn't allowed to wear that in the hospital I think it will uh, have, get the public on the the side of the mm. NHS who you know, especially those who thought we were being protected when when we weren't you know I, I tried to liken it to something a bit more simplistic I mean as I said no no protection is 100%, but you wouldn't send a construction worker onto a construction site with a broken hard hat and think that that's okay. 
So why would you send a healthcare worker into a ward full of patients with an infectious disease, be it airborne or not, uh, with a mask that you know is not going to protect them even adequately from droplet infection, let alone from airborne infection? Why, why would you do? Why is that OK? I used to work full time. Um, I used to do disaster response. It's how I was in the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. Uh, so I used to do epidemic and disaster resp response with an NGO. I can't do that now. How, how, how can I how can I persuade an organisation that they should send someone like me out who needs a mobility scooter to get a significant distance? How can I go to a disaster zone? Um, I walk with crutches. I can barely commute to work unless I can drive or get a minicab and then it exhausts me. Um, you know, I can't be a full time clinician anymore because I simply haven't got the capacity to do that physically anymore. Um, you know, even working full time from home uh, academically is a challenge for me because I can have a day where I get a lot done, but then it will have an impact on the next day and the next day. Yeah, I had so many meetings. I provided the evidence that I had available to me at the time. I was told it wasn't good enough evidence. Uh, but no evidence was provided to the contrary. The only thing that was provided was the flowchart. And they kept bringing this flowchart out. And I was like, I've seen that flowchart. It doesn't explain the decision making process. It doesn't explain why you're ignoring this evidence. So your PPE was like Joanna's? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well I mean, at times Joanna was wearing an FFP3 mask uh, in certain areas, but we were never allowed that. We were only given those blue surgical masks, the plastic apron and the gloves. People acknowledging that mistakes were made mm. and learning lessons and changing it the guidance hasn't changed the guidance is still the same we've got an, another outbreak of covid going on in our communities at the moment some people will be going into hospital with that and healthcare workers are still being given a blue mask you know you can't say you want to learn from the pandemic and then not make any changes you can't say you're sorry if you are still using the same guidance so much evidence now to show that there's airborne spread. There's so much evidence now to show that there's more airborne spread through coughing than there is through an aerosol generating procedure. And yet we don't change the guidance. Yeah, I've just um, pretty much just got my certificate of completion of training to be a consultant and I won't won't be the <sighs> consultant I thought I'd be. I mean, hopefully there's still something I can do that's related, but not, not how I would like. I mean, how do I now go to an Ebola epidemic? How do I go and continue doing my research in Ebola? I mean, uh, you know, a, a few years before the pandemic, 2017, I was in uh, Sierra Leone for 10 months, recruited two and a half thousand people to a study of Ebola genetics in rural communities in Sierra Leone that you can't get to half the time in the rainy season because they're, uh, you know, the roads are flooded. You know, how, how, how do I now do that? How do I follow up on that? It leaves me with a slight identity crisis because I think when you've worked for so long to be something mm. and you know you've worked your way up in your career and you always envisaged something mm. and then that is no longer going to be the case I think then you do have a slight identity crisis I don't think you necessarily realize at the time how much of your identity is vested in your career and perhaps it shouldn't be but you know perhaps that's you know we shouldn't maybe be so driven in that way but I think when someone suddenly removes that from you you're suddenly like well, who am I now? What do I do mm. now?